Okay. There is a saying. You must learn a new way to think before you master a new way to be. You must learn a new way to think before you master a new way to be. I want to take you on a journey to show you a place that I've been, experiences that I've experienced. For the last decades of my life, it's been a very intense journey. And we're walking out of the forest to share some of that, those fruits with you. But I realize as much as I want to take you straight to the experience, because that's so much what is needed, that is so much what's missing, that's so much what we're yearning for. That for some people we've seen when they step into the mastery program, when they step into the seminars, and such powerful things happen, such transformative things happen, the heavens open up for them, whatever happens, happens. It can be disorientating for some people because they don't really understand what is this thing, what are they experiencing, and where is this coming from, and what is this about? We live in an extraordinary generation where tools, techniques, resources of self-transformation, of spiritual experience are, are, are pouring into the world at an unprecedented level, at an exponential rate. And I believe we have something extraordinary to add to that dialogue, to add to that conversation. And that's why we put together the mastery program. That's why we put together the seminar these elevation teachings, but what we are doing here in the Ele Elevation Foundation series is to give you the foundations for what we're doing. Because there's a rabbi that taught me something once. He said, Torah is so misunderstood. Judaism is so misunderstood because there are so many details there is so much nuance. It's so easy to become OCD about so many of those details and the details within the details of the legal system, of the halachic system. And so many people that can even practice that can live their lives so connected to the details, but it's possible to become so disconnected to the source. I understand so many of the pieces, but what was I building? This, this teacher said to me a beautiful idea. He, he said, you ever have, and I did, you know, the, the, a bucket of Lego when you were young. Anyone have a bucket of Lego when they're young? I had a big bucket of Lego when I was young with all these colors and all these sticks and all these things. You know, and you just think it's a bunch of stuff you can build. But I remember, you know, one time I, someone gave me a new thing and it was like all these pieces, whatever, and I was taking it out of the box. And then I didn't even look at the box because the box was gift wrapped. But finally, I, I, after I opened it, then I took up the gift wrapping and then there was this picture of a spaceship. And when you see the picture of the spaceship, then you go, oh, is that what the blocks build? Is that how it all comes together? Because those blocks, those details, these mitzvahs, where the Torah interests you or not, or religion interests you or not, or God interests you or not, that there's a vision here. And I think anyone that's not interested, it's because they don't yet get how profound it is. Because at best, they've just seen some of the details or exposed to someone who's OCD-ly, I kind of turned that into a new form of the word, engaging in those details. But there's a picture of something that's supposed to be built. And what we want to do in Elevation Foundations is show you what was supposed to be built. And what's supposed to be built is, is, is the ultimate human consciousness. What's supposed to be built, what the Torah is there to teach us and Kabbalah is there to teach us and Hasidus is there to teach us, is what is the possible you? What is the full capacity of consciousness, of psychology, of the human experience? 
sometimes people turn up to an elevation event and they say, you know, why did they come? And they say, well, because I have this block and I'm trying to get, make, get a breakthrough in my life. I've had this emotional issue. I'm after, you know, a spiritual meditational experience. I was in India and I saw something and I want to see, does Judaism have anything to offer in that, in that sector? I, you know, I, I had this physical pain and a physical illness. I'm looking for a way to get healing. And people have incredible breakthroughs and opportunities open for understanding opens for them, but they're still missing a fundamental thing, which that their lives are being set, determined, what am I living for? Who am I? What can I be? There's a massive glass ceiling set on all of us by the world that we live in that says, this is what you should be, and this is what you could look like, and that's as good as it looks, as good as it gets. And the reason I access some of this material is because I want to get a block. I want, I want to get over block. I want to have a, big, a nice spiritual experience. And then I can come back to usually my mundane life experience and just kind of integrate that or not integrate it or enjoy it or you know, disconnect for it or forget it or grab another basket and go to another seminar and fill up with the next load. But, but, but what am I building? What are you building? What Elevation Foundation Series is going to attempt to do is redefine what is possible for every single one of us, and what is possible for the whole human race. I know that sounds arrogant, or it sounds delusional, or it sounds really ambitious, and I'm gonna take some keys from our tradition, from thousands of years of the Torah Kabbalistic tradition, and people think that I make things sound cool or popular, I spin things. I'm going to show you that everything I'm saying is 100% sourced. And all our sages were teaching us for thousands of years. And I'm going to put that on the table in front of you. I'm going to say, does any of this speak to you? Does any of this ring true to you? Some people will be astonished. Some people say, that's impossible. It can't possibly be. Some people say, maybe it's only for big people, but I myself, a little person, could never attain that. Some people say, I'm just so caught in my little life, my little blocks, and my little issues. I just make the pain go away. And you know what? That's okay, because a lot of us are dealing with a lot of pain, and it's okay to want the pain to go away. And there are tools you can learn to help the pain go away, and that's fine. But at some point, we will never evolve until we understand that the true potential we were destined to embody as individuals, as a nation, as a race, a human race. So I want to show you that. So for Elevation Foundation series that we're learning together is an introduction to understand what is possible. And there's certain steps, and I'm going to define them to you very clearly. And then once you've got that and that interests you, then we will engage, continue in the mastery program, the seminars, and then we'll show you, we'll, we'll dive you down straight into the experience, straight into the breakthroughs, straight to show you how to transform your mind, how to concentrate better, how to break through that blocks, how to have profound supernatural experiences, how to develop your intuition, your creativity, how to profoundly deepen your relationships, all these wonderful, cool, awesome stuff. But now you get, what are we trying to build? Why is this good stuff? Why is it important? Besides the fact that it's cool, besides the fact that we're psychonauts, we like to explore stuff, besides, Besides the fact I'm trying to get over that block, that issue, that relationship, whatever that was, I understand more and more that some people don't like to see the big picture. They, don't, they get overwhelmed by it. So those people are welcome. Bavakasha, as we say in this country. Go dive into the experiential things. But for those that are seeking to understand the big picture, who we are, what is the depth of the Torah speaking to? What's the depth that the divine, the infinite, is motivating us to step into within our own lives, within our own history, us as individuals and us as a generation? I, I want to take a few sessions together to show you that map. Because when I saw it and when I felt it, I realized it was one of the most extraordinary things I'd ever experienced. And I've experienced a lot. And I hope that it will speak to some people, inspire some people, broaden your horizons, we have to broaden our horizons because then I know there's a new way to act. First, I'm going to understand what is that thing that all those actions are allowing me to be. That is my introduction. Let's begin. What if I told you right now that you right now in this room, that you right now watching this video, that you have the capacity right now to close your eyes, tilt your head back, 
and literally blast out of your body. To open up into an expanse of consciousness which is beyond the limited, finite, key brain consciousness that we usually try and interact with the world with and open up to the divine, infinite light within us and immerse into that light and dissolve into that light and fill it one with the cosmic energy which is, which is pouring through all of reality. And in that place, all your fears, your doubts, a lifetime of, of ego, of yearning, of frustration, of pain dissolves and melts away. And in that place, you feel one with the earth, one with yourself, one with the human race, one with the world, one with the infinite, and you have clarity and you have wisdom and it is extraordinary and it is radiant. And what if I told you it doesn't take drugs? And it's not just for spiritual masters. Loba Shamayim He, it's not only in heaven for the, all the great masters to access. What if I told you you could get that right now? One. And then what if I told you that when you opened your eyes, you didn't actually have to lose that? What if I told you that some of that elements of, of those properties could remain with you even with your eyes open, even as you walk throughout reality, engage in the real world? And that would give you an incredible place of, 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 of within you of clarity, of strength, of confidence, of seeing good even in challenging times. And when thought, thoughts of fear, of pain, of panic, of confusion want to rise up and overwhelm you, somehow this state, this consciousness just kind of looks at those fears and dissolves it and releases it. So you have faith in yourself and faith in the world and you feel clearer and stronger and it strengthens relationships because you feel less threatened in all relationships, less challenged if someone assault, insults you or attacks you or doesn't respect you because you feel clear and confident and you see in confusing, overwhelming times, you see, you sense, you intuitively can sense that there's good here, that there's value here, that I'm being guided here. I'm not talking about an abstract, abstract religious concept. I'm talking about a, a mechanism of your consciousness that is with you. And then you can experience that too. And what if I told you that by knowing that place, experiencing that place, learning to maintain that place, which increases your resilience, your sense of equanimity, your sense of balance and harmony, the sense of good, which increases your sense of compassion and goodness. And, and it, not only that, but it gave you energy, physical energy, emotional energy, spiritual energy, but that you could control your energy, that you would have energy, you would have strength, you would feel strong and not tired and overwhelmed. And not only that, that there's a positive energy and negative energy. You become extraordinarily energetically sensitive to what depletes me and what engages me. And you would have the power to control that because that level of consciousness would be feeding me in an intuitive sense, physical energy into my body. And what if I told you for that you could use that awareness, you could use that intuition, you could use that state to release a lifetime of negative, destructive, emotional buildup. The things that we go to thera therapists for, and sometimes the therapy helps, and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes the technique is good, and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes I spend thousands of dollars and 20 years, and I can't quite make that breakthrough. What if I told you that accessing that state and accessing that light and using that intuitive state and using that chiyas, you can melt away and release all the fears and all the egos and all the trauma and all the doubt and all the pain, no matter what happened in our history. Now in the present moment, I could myself in my own consciousness shift and release that in real time. And what if I told you that that just doesn't work on a, a mind level, of an emotional level, it comes to a physical level in your body? That so much as, as science today is discovering finally 4,000 years later, but it's better late than never, that so much illness and so much of our pains and so much of our physical issues are caused by our psychological state and that you could use that awareness and that intuition and that light and you could in real time dissolve away illness, major illness. And what if I told you that you don't just have to take that light down, you can take that light up, you can source into it and learn in an incredible way that many people would consider supernatural 
to develop outrageous levels of intuition, of insight, to get something called guidance, which means when you're confused in life, you can resource to access source into that place and get answers to questions. Why is this happening? What should I do? That you could massively increase your capacity for creativity, for problem solving, that the idea comes to you and it's brilliant and it's perfect and it's smarter than I ever could be and it's there in my head and you could understand why people are going through their issues and it will come to you. They say, where did you get that from? And you're like, there it is. It just came to me, but I could control that on cue. And if this doesn't sound weird enough to you, so then my friends, what if I told you that you didn't just have the capacity to access that state yourself and get that energy yourself and feel that confidence and clarity and resilience and build that up, that fears and doubts and imagery that come to you, you can resolve them away with the confidence that comes from that and not just emotionally heal yourself from trauma and emote blocks and all those things and not just physically heal yourself. What if I told you that you could do that to other people by just binding your consciousness with theirs, that all those things you could affect in yourself, you could in real time affect those healing in others, that transformation in others. You could knock them into higher states of consciousness. What if I told you by doing that? Then you develop such a profound alignment. Alignment of all the dimensions, all of the levels of our consciousness, the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, the belief systems. Such a profound real-time al alignment that what would happen is your consciousness would become so superpowered that what you fixed your attention on, you could cause to happen in reality. You could draw towards you that which you need drawing towards you. You could push away in your consciousness and mind alone. That's what you see needs to. And your mind would become a creative force within itself that can literally shape and sculpt your destiny. And... What if I told you that wasn't just a technique or a seminar or something cool to do, but it's something you could learn to harness and access and maintain throughout every dimension of your life, every relationship, every interaction, every point of engagement from morning to night that was possible to maintain that light and energy, was possible to maintain the intuitive sense of goodness and value of compassion that in a state, it's possible to be constantly in real time healing and releasing negative destructive thoughts and negative destructive emotions. It's constantly in real time to be investing energy into my body and engaging that. It's constantly possible to actually maintain that as I'm talking to others and healing and engaging, I'm drawing out everything, I'm interacting with reality, with physical objects in space and time, including animals, including individuals, and to be shifting that power, living with that intuition, gaining that insight, connecting and transforming everything I'm interacting with, people or objects, whatever it is, and to the point where I'm elevating the whole of the world and the whole of myself at any given moment. What have I told you? That that's the picture the Torah is trying to paint for us about what you are supposed to be. Not supposed to as in, yeah, right, Rabbi, one day maybe. But that you have those innate capacities for health, for healing, for clarity, for intuition, for spiritual direct contact now within you. And that that could be awakened it could be turned on, it could be crafted and clarified, and it could be maintained. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? I feel like a, a, a secondhand car salesman when I, when I pitch this stuff, and how much would you expect to pay? For now, $9.95 plus postage and handling, we can send that to you. It's embarrassing to pitch it to you like that. But from the last 20 years of my life, I went on a journey. When I, was, when I was 25, I had no Jewish identity at all. I certainly did not look like this. I had no awareness of Judaism. I never learned to her. I had no Jewish friends, no Jewish identity when I was 25. Now that I'm 26, it's been a very intensive year, let me tell you. 
I was a film producer and director and a theater director and all these kind of things. And I was also a spiritual seeker. And I'd done all the cool stuff that nice young Jewish boys do when they don't know anything about Judaism. Whereas I did Buddhism and I did Hinduism and Sufism and I did the shamanistic thing and all those kind of lying down on the floor like, let's not actually go there right now. But uh, I, I did those meditation retreats and I, I did all these wonderful, extraordinary, searching things. And if you would have told me when I was 25 that where would I find the punchline, where would I find all those things, but all taken to the next level was in Judaism, I would have said, you are out of your mind. And I was blessed, blessed, blessed to be taken out of my mind because my mind was too small. I never would have conceived where the destination was I was being taken to. And I was taken to a very powerful experience over a few months and at the end of the day, the result was go to Jerusalem and learn because you're going to find something extraordinary there. And it's definitely, I can't tell you it was a blissful experience and I can't tell you it was an easy experience. But I can tell you that for the last few years, we've taken, we've searched and we've found. And what we're doing here with all of this is I want to deliver that to you. I want to show you what it is. And I want to see that look in your eyes and how amazing it is, like is the look of my eyes and my friend's eyes and my rabbi's eyes and my teacher's eyes. Because I want you to know what you can do and we want the generation to know what, what we all can do. So that thing that I just told you about, most of us think it's not possible, can't be possible. Otherwise, why don't we learn that in school? Why don't we have a course on that in college? Like everything valuable we learn in school, right? Imagine we learned these things in schools. It's possible. The next 20 years, it's possible. This is what's coming out. This is what's being revealed. What is that thing that I just told you about? It has a name, you know. It isn't just something I made up. It is not something I'm putting a new age spin on because it's something I just took the Hebrew words off because if I would have said to you what the Hebrew words were for all of that, you would have said, that's not what those things mean. But I promise you, it's actually what they mean. And I can show you literally hundreds of sources that say explicitly that's all they ever meant. So how do we think it meant something different? A long, historical, complex story. But let's not go backwards. Let's stay present and move forward. If you take off all those complex Hebrew names, these are the experiences they're defining. And there's one experience, there's one experience that when you put it all together, there's, there's a place, there's, there's, there's a technique, there is a skill set, there is a mitzvah. I don't like using the religious terms because it throws people off. We think we know what it means and then we reject it, but we didn't really get what it meant, the depth of it, the secrets behind it. They weren't ready to be revealed in their depth like they're ready to be revealed in their depth in this generation to us. There is one mitzvah which is the training ground to teach you how to do all these things we've done, all those things I just talked about. And I want you to know thousands of people have already learned to do these things and we're teaching them to people. Does anyone know what the term is for this thing? I'm going to tell you what the term is, but I'm actually literally afraid to tell you what, the, what this term is. Because when I'm going to say this term, I'm going to say it in Hebrew, and a lot of you don't know Hebrew. So then I'm going to have to say it in English. And you, the second I say it in English, you're going to go, oh, that's not that. That's just that religious thing. Because the boxes that we have in our mind for terms, for words, and the associations we build around them are corrupted, especially for religious concepts. For example, God, how ridiculous is the word God? How, how silly are the concepts around God? The famous line, Rabbi, I don't believe in God. And the answer is, I also don't believe in God. What do you mean you don't believe in God? You're religious. Yeah, but the God that you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. All the concepts we've built around that word God are so silly. Why would any religious person choose to believe them? They must be mad. And that's a reasonable thing to say. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a lot of false idols and smash them. And the false idols we're going to smash are, are, are religious concepts or Torah concepts. 
We're going to smash, me as a religious do, a thousand Torah concepts together. And why are we going to do that? It's not because I'm smashing together Judaism. We're going to smash our assumptions of what things are and reveal what they were always meant to be. We're going to smash the body to reveal the soul. So I'm going to tell you what this word is, but you have to work very hard not to let that silly English word come in and corrupt all the th- and then all that beautiful building I just built up about what's possible and all those skill sets and possibilities. You're going to say it's all going to collapse. You're going to go, oh, that's just that. But now I'm going to show you how we got to this f- silly thing, how we ever thought that God is this big guy in a cloud with a beard and a lightning rod and you know, surrounded by you know, fat naked babies with wings on. How will that ever, and, and you guys worship that, you, you're out of your mind. You are out of your mind if you're worshiping that, 100%. You know what we call those capacities, those nine elements I just told you? We call it this word. Tefillah. Hands up if you know what that word means. Hands up if you do not know what that word means. Excellent. This is how that word looks. In the holy language. Are you ready? The word means prayer. Prayer. You see how I messed it up now, didn't I? So when I say prayer, you think what? I'm sorry, I I, I see that little girl by her bed with her hands kind of cupped like this. Now I want you to take the word prayer Right? And I want you to crumple it up in your mind. I want you to throw it in the bin and get the three-point shot. And then I want us to move on with our lives together into a much more extraordinary world of extraordinary possibilities. The word prayer will no longer be used. From now on in, we're going to use this word to fill it because not just the word, the structure of the word, the shape of the word, the letters of the word reveal the secrets of what's possible to you. I heard many years ago when I first came to Israel, I, I heard a story, I have to tell you the story. A teacher was teaching a class about prayer. I don't like using that religious term, you'll forgive me. And this is the story the teacher told. He says, there's a man walking down a beach. And as the man is walking down the beach, it's a, a big blue sky and a big, huge ocean. And, and it's a warm, wonderful day. And as the man is walking down the beach, the man notices that right at the shore, right at the front of the shore, right where the sand hits the sea, there's a tiny little boy. This boy's around nine, 10 years old. And the boy's all dressed up with a suit, with a bow tie. And next to this boy is these three little bags, one, two, three, three little cases. And the boy's just waving out to the water, waving out to the water like this. And this man's walking down the beach and he sees this child. He sees this child standing there. And the man's like, how, how crazy, what's this child doing there? Well, he's all dressed up and nowhere to go. He's got his cases there. And the man walks up to the child, trying to work out what the child's looking at. And the child's waving, waving like this. And the man's like, what's this child doing? The man looks out, looks out, and way, 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 way on the horizon, way, way, way in the distance, there's a huge, massive ocean liner, though it's the size of an ant right now, and it's moving, it's sailing from one side of the ocean to another across the horizon. This ocean liner, and the boy is waving like he's hailing a cab. And the, the, the man looks at this poor child and, as if, like, poor kid. What, he thinks he's trying to hail a cab, hail a taxi. Like, you know, like that huge ocean liner with the thousands of people is going to, like, turn around and come to him. And the child is waving, waving, waving. And the man feels very sorry for this poor child, right? And the man walks up to the child and says, hey, kid, hey, kid. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, to, I don't want to you know, break, you know break the news to you, it's very bad, you know, there's no way a boat like that, that size, so far away, is really going to come and, you know, all the way over here and pick you up. And the child just looks up with the most innocent open eyes to this man as this man is trying to ground him in reality, so to speak, ground him down through reality is really what he's doing. And the child just looks up at the, 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 the man and says, no, you don't understand. And as the child says, you don't understand, suddenly there's a huge sound, a huge siren, a huge horn and it's coming from that boat. And at that moment, they both turn to look up at the boat. And at that moment, there's the captain of the ship and he runs to the, he's on the bow and he runs up to the edge and holds onto the banister and he sees the little boy and he starts waving back. And the boy's waving to the man and the, the captain's waving to the boy and all of a sudden the ship starts turning, turning, turning towards the shore and starts coming towards them and the man is in shock. And the sweet, innocent boy looks up at the man and says, you don't understand. The captain of the ship is my father. 
captain of the ship is my father. When this teacher told me this story, now listen very carefully. He said, you know what this story is about? It's about prayer. The ship is nature, the way of the world, the physical momentum, the physical energy. This is how things go. This is how nature functions. This is what science says. This is what reason says. But Hashem is our father, Avinu Shebeshemayim, our father in the highest source spiritual world. And we are Bonam Atem Hashem and We are all the children of the divine, the children of the infinite. And when Hashem wants to, because he loves us, when we need something in turn to him, he's willing to change the whole course of nature of history because he cares for us. And that's what prayer is. Do you hear it? Now I have a confession to make. I hate this story. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's so sickly sweet. You know, I mean, all these kind of, oh, he's my father in heaven. It's very nice. I, I get it's a nice, sweet story if you're into that kind of stuff, right? But there's something that really troubles me about this story, and I just have to get this off my chest. I mean, it's a sweet story. It's a nice story. If, if it strengthens you or gives you clarity, you feel welcome to use it. I personally would never waste you know, five minutes telling it in my own class or seminar, right? But, but this is what really troubled me about the story as I hear it, okay, as I listen to it at this time. What troubled me is basically everything happening in this story basically perfectly well sums up everything that's gone wrong with religion in the modern world. The entire understanding of God, of us, of our relationship together, of what prayer is, is literally all the disasters happening to us are really because of, of what's, what, what, the way the story is presented. For example, Number one, the, 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 God is so far away. He's infinitely far away. He's infinitely off in the distance, besides the fact he's a man and a father and all that kind of imagery, right? He's infinitely far off in the distance, number one. Number two, the only way you can get his attention is you have to do massive exhaustion, massive physical activity, right? Number three is, and until you do, he, he's totally unaware of your existence or what you need. And he's like, oh, he's totally bewildered. Oh, who's that over there? Oh, what were they doing? What they're up to? And then if he actually cares about us enough, then he has to schlep his way, pardon my French, he has to schlep his way across oceans to finally save us and get to us. That's outrageous. Where the truth is, my friends, the total, total opposite. Hashem, the infinite, the source, the all ain't self, the generator, the constant conscious, compassionate, infinite generator of all the reality, our guide, our source, is not infinitely far away. The infinite is, is, is infinitely close. In fact, you can't even use distance with him because we're within that infinite consciousness right now. You don't have to exert yourself with massive energy, with massive activity, because he's right there. It's right there and right present and right conscious with us. It's not that you have to tell the infinite something the infinite doesn't already know. You already have his attention. You see, it's, it's the same way that, you know, if, if my hand is, is hot or my hand is cold, so when my hand is hot and my hand is cold and it wants to warm up, it doesn't have to get my attention. Hey, you, cats, yeah, what, what, I'm cold. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that, let me write. It's an extension, it's one and the same. You don't have to get the divine's attention. You already have his attention. The question is, does he have your attention? The question is, does he have your attention when you control and expand and open your intention to him, to that place? Then the connection is right there. There's no way he has to get to. There's no distance you have to cover. There's no news you have to deliver. There's nothing you have to make him aware of. You have to just open and focus and choose and expand to be aware of that which was already there within us and around us. And when you do, then the reality transforms around that. It's bent around that. Opportunity opens that according to nature was impossible before that. Do you see how ridiculous this story is? You see how poor our, our, our understanding of prayer is? The time has come for a new story. A generation needs a new story.
questions? Do you have any questions of what we're saying so far? Any have questions but just don't want to ask them? Oh, there's one. Yes, sir. Sweet, please stand up. So I actually connected to the story you gave, and now I'm wondering. And now I destroyed it for you. And you want your bit, money back. A okay, bit. I understood. So if I don't have to wave at the boat, yes. what do I have to do? Um, bri a bribe usually works to the gabi, right? <laughs> Um, Does God take Bitcoin? <laughs> That's a little politically uh, complex for me to get into as a rabbi. We can talk about that after the class. Um, what you have to do is you have to fall back into the awareness of it all. And you have to learn how to align yourself to step into that knowledge. And then you have to learn how to use your mind to shift reality once you have created that connection. And while the words father are Kabbalistically meaningful and relevant, and why the, why, while the word, you know, the father in heaven is profound and meaningful and relevant, our understanding is so superficial and external that sometimes it's no longer helpful to us. So we have to relearn, re-explore, redefine these terms in consciousness. And then suddenly we breathe the reality and the potency back into them. You hear it? Bear with us. Any other questions for now? Yes, sir. Um, so you use the metaphor of a, a ship captain and his son. Um, and uh, while I haven't heard that one specifically, we usually hear uh, a king or a prince. Oh, yeah, I know that story as well. Right, right in right. castle. The and one about the king. Right. Yeah, or there's many walls in between you and him. From and here, we learn that God owns a boat and has a nice house. Right, that, that, right. That's as so. much as we've worked out so far about him. Right, right. right. Um, so Real is, estate. Right, right. right. Good. Um, is, the, is that metaphor any better, or does it fall prey to the same? It, uh, for, uh, super... all, all, all these things, every Kabbalistic work you ever open up always begins with the same line which is we are going to use physical forms as a way to express the depth of the experience. And then they write, and if it was our generation, they would underline it and bold it. And you know, if it's on Facebook, they did a little asterisk to get the bold effect, whatever. And then they say, but don't think this is the actual reality we are referring to. Don't confuse this with the actual experience divine unity. Let me tell you a secret. What I'm going to share with you, what we're talking about introducing right now, it used to be extremely known and common of profound spiritual experience that these mystics were living with on a daily level. This is how they defined reality and the Torah concept of reality and what you were supposed to do. And therefore, when they were ex experiencing divine sense of unity, transcendent out-of-the-body experience of energy, of the capacity to shift that and move that, to be open to that, to immerse themselves in that sea of light and wisdom. So when you use the concept of a king, that they moderated the concept of the king to be able to be relevant to that experience. But once we all lost the experience as a whole, then we held on to this very external, almost ridiculous imagery. So if I say to you, when we learn Kabbalah together, don't think he's actually a king on a boat with a good real estate package, right? And you're like, of course, I would never think that. You guys aren't stupid. You would never think that either, right? But when you don't actually have the internal reference point, you know what you're not supposed to think, but you're not experiencing the thing you are supposed to experience. And therefore, it only eventually leaves us empty. And after empty, it becomes superficial. Superficial is the best. And then it becomes, I have to kill for my God against you people because you've got the wrong God and my God's got a bigger house and a bigger palace and a nice and that's a boat, right? And he's giving a big package deal if I, if I kill enough people, do you know what I mean? And therefore we actually stepped into a delusion where we think we are more religious because we bought into idol worship. Of Cook says explicitly that the, the end of day is one of the signs it's going to come to is that it's going to be possible for a religious person to be an idol worshiper by the way they approach religion themselves. There's a lot to say there, but that's enough. When you regenerate the eternal experience, then these things suddenly return to their former potency. 
So I want to talk about what prayer is, and I want to talk about what prayer was supposed to be. Simply put, tefillah is the most powerful tool and resource ever given to humanity. I want you to bury and forget the word prayer forever. And I want to talk about the word tefillah. It's not just a religious act for religious people. You don't need to believe in God to pray. Yes, you heard me right. You don't even have to like the concept of God to pray. You don't have to believe in God to use your intellect. You don't have to believe in God to use your heart. You don't have to believe in God to use your hand. Prayer is simply the full spectrum experience of mastery of every dimension of your consciousness and all its faculties in the full spectrum used and harnessed together to step into the full experience of what it means to be human and a supernatural being. Supernatural being because we are supernatural beings. Really, we have incredible powers and capacities to do amazing things, but we've never been taught what they are and how to access them and fully turn them on. When you turn them all on at the same time, that is a mechanism called to fill up. And there's a reason when I'm teaching this, I'm a little dubious in going into this whole discussion, I want you to know. Is this a class for religious people? Is this a class for, I hate using the word secular, what is religious, what is secular? These are nonsensical terms, right? They also are idols that we need to destroy and rebuild something real and relevant and potent, okay? But whatever you consider yourself as a human being on any kind of spectrum, the second I start talking about prayer or to fill us, so that's, oh, that's, that's not a class I'm into. I may be into mindfulness or consciousness. I may to be psychology or self-development. I may into understanding Kabbalah, but you know, th this idea itself, I don't understand what it means. So what, what I'm trying to allow you to see, and this is what I want to show you, teach you how I developed a little of this curriculum. Because I think that will inform the challenge we're having educationally. And why, but what I'm going to say is that this is relevant for every human being who's seeking to master their own mind and master their own life. One of the things I noticed as a Torah Jew on a Torah Jewish journey is that there's this commandment every day that we do in the Torah Jewish world, and it's called prayer, tefillah. And we do it three times a day. And when we do it three times a day, we read from a formal Hebrew prayer book. And it's a bit difficult to make it interesting or relevant or meaningful. And some people struggle, and some people give up, and some people become numb to it. Right? And there's all this kind of complexity involved. Some people make it meaningful, meaningful for themselves randomly, and no one else can figure out how. Right? And every now and then, you open up a book, and they describe it as the most supernatural, extraordinary, enlightened experience. And you just stare at these words and say, how did they get from here to there? The average Torah Jew who, who will be listening to this class as well, and, and they know that on a daily level they deal with many certain challenges. How do I make this experience of praying from a prayer book you know, meaningful to me? How do you say the same words every day and actually make that meaningful? How does it not become monotonous or boring or frustrating, etc., etc.? How do I concentrate? I can't even concentrate. I can't even concentrate. An hour, a Jewish male, a religious Jewish male will be praying at least an hour and a half every day, focusing on the same words they've done over and over a thousand times before. That's almost impossible. And you're supposed to feel emotionally connected to the same ideas just at any given moment? Do you hear the challenge? Now, if you're not a Torah Jew and you're not into that, you're like, well, tough luck serves them right for being religious in the first place, right? Maybe they should come do some Buddhist mindfulness with the rest of us and have fun. But this is what I want to tell you, and this is the secret, and this is the opening point. Even if you don't want to do that and you don't like doing it, which is totally fine, and you never plan to do it, which is totally fine, there's a secret here. When our sages composed this matbea, this formula that we're supposed to say, these very energetically powerful Hebrew words, there's certain assumptions that they made that every human being has the capacity to do. And when they gave this gift, and when this was brought down, there was an assumption that they made. And the assumption that they made is that you have the capacity for perfect concentration. Perfect concentration that you can choose at will 
to put your attention on something and be 100% locked in focus so not, not, not a single other thought gets in your way. That's why they gave that over. But you're, yeah, but bye -bye. we live in 2000, whatever it is, when you're watching this video, right? And, you know, we were all brought up on Sesame Street and then MTV, and right now Facebook has finished us completely, right? Bye -bye. I have not, not perfect concentration, but pretty good, as long as the Adderall is, is ad you know, going in my system. It hasn't uh, gone out of my bloodstream yet, right? So you understand, you understand that it's so unrealistic. But our sages made the assumption that, A, you have 100% perfect conversation, concentration. Do you? What did they know that they thought you could do that? And what if I told you they also supplied the instruction manual to do that? What if I told you it works not only not only if you're not ADD, it even works if you're ADD, and for some strange reason, and we can talk about another time, it seems to work better for people that have ADHD. When our sages told us to do this thing, you said this is not a religious issue right now, this is, this is something everybody's relevant for, right? What if I told you that when our sages gave us this thing and told us to use it, and one of the assumptions they made is that any other distracting thoughts in your mind you can turn off, because many religious Jews, Torah Jews will say when they go to pray, all the thoughts of the day are filling their mind and they're overwhelmed, therefore every time they go to pray, they're just flooded with external outside thoughts, right? So our sages made the assumption that you can learn not that you could learn that you must be able to, that you're actually able to turn those things off on a dime. Would you like to know how to do that? See, that's not a religious act. That's a fundamental human act. That's an evolved human act. More than that, our sages knew and knew that every human being, because the Selim Elohim, the divine image that we're created in, has the capacity not just to take away negative thoughts. Thoughts are not negative. It's not this monkey mind we're always trying to eliminate or destroy or negate. Torah is not a path of negation, it's a path of elevation. You are supposed to use your mind to fully focus and engage like a laser beam into an idea that you could take an idea or thought and zoom into it so deeply that it expands and consumes your consciousness until you can completely immerse with it that at any given time and have deep insight, perception, perspective on that idea and until it, it inculcates that into your entire being. The reason they, they formulated the script that they allow us to enter into is not as a religious experience, it's because they assume you had that skill set. And most people say, I don't have that skill set. And our sages say, yes, you do, and we're going to show you how to turn that on. An assumption our sages made about prayer is that you have a 100% emotional control, that any negative fear, lust, pain, doubt, ego at any moment is overwhelming you. You absolutely can't stop it on a dime, and you can absolutely flood your heart with positive, overwhelming emotion that is so powerful that actually blows you out of your body into a higher spiritual state. And that means that you're working the office, you're working on Wall Street, you're, you're running that deal, you're an entrepreneur, you're uh, 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 keeping a home, raising children, whatever you're doing, and you're overwhelmed and you have to pray. If you're not a relig religious Torah Jew, this may not interest you, but it doesn't matter. You're going to see it should interest you because they're assuming that when you have this obligation to pray right now, that my moment I can turn off my thoughts, I can turn off the negative, the doubt, the fear, the overwhelmingness. I can step instantly to a place of connecting to a higher goal, a higher mission. I can flood my conscious, my heart with that state. I can turn off blocks. I can overcome them and these are skill sets they assumed you could do and the reason they assumed you could do is because you can do it and if you can't do it it's probably because never showed you how because you've never seen these texts because they were too, way too religious or irrelevant etc and one of the most profound assumptions that they always thought that you would know how to do because you can do it is that God for you was not a belief it was not a dogma it was not a guy in the sky in the clouds God for you was a transcendent experience it was something extraordinary and expansive and transformational to make contact with, to enter into, because it's a part of you. It's not a place you have to go across the oceans. And that when you went to pray, people say to me sometimes, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, Torah Jews struggling will say, you know, I'm talking to God, I feel I'm just talking to myself. Go out to a forest where Nachman says amazing things. Go out to a forest and connect with the, the energy, the consciousness of the trees and the animals and allow that to help your prayer. They say, I'm, I'm talking, but I'm really talking to myself. You are talking to yourself. Because the sad thing is they're talking to their, their, their false self, their fallen self. 
that true self is one with the divine, is one with the infinite. And when you learn to access that state, then you're talking beyond yourself. And it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue. You get what I mean by a dialogue. There's an answer that comes back. But who does that? These are the skill sets that is assumed that you knew how to do. You have complete emotional control. You have perfect concentration. You have access to complete divine consciousness within you. And when a sage has told us this is what to feel is, suddenly you realize that if you turn those, you get into those states and you use that skill set, and then you open up those words, and then you read from those words, you will find extraordinary things happen. But what's missing, what is the problem? The problem is that we're using the words. You know what the problem is? I was going to say, we're using the software without the hardware. We're using the software without the hardware. You know when you download an app, you download some new software on your computer, and your computer is, is you know, got so many issues, and it's running slow, and the hard drive is fragmented, and it's, you, know, you really should have upgraded two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And therefore, you download something new, and it hardly runs, and it's buggy, and it stalls, right? So you say, you know, that this software is terrible, this app is terrible. But it could be the app is fine, and the software is fine, but your computer is too slow. So if you clean out the hardware, if you clean out the hard drive, if you upgrade the hard drive, then you use the app, and then you download the app, and suddenly you can do on your old machine amazing things, amazing skills, amazing you know, tasks. You, you could do something in a whole new way that you could never do before. The problem is not the prayer book. The prayer book is the software. What we want to teach you in elevation, this is not a class, you know, how do you pray better for, for Torah Jews? You know, how do you, how do you make, it, make it more meaningful, give me deeper interpretations of the words, give me better explanations, what is the feel, what's it about? That never makes us pray better as Torah Jews. It makes it it's nicer, the more understanding, and a few minutes later, I'm back to where I was before. What elevation wants to give you is not another software download, but a hardware upgrade. What we are going to attempt to do in elevation in the mastery program, in, in, in the seminars, what we're attempting to do is, is break down the map of human consciousness, the map of human potential. There are seven or eight, depending on how I feel on the day, different core parts, core faculties of human consciousness. If you know what they are, if you know how they work, if you know how to control them, you can do extraordinary things. So what we want to do is we want to map out human consciousness and we want to show you how you can transform it and affect it and work with it and teach you the skill sets to use it in an unprecedented way. And when you do that, you realize then you can take the Hebrew prayers if that interests you and you can plug them in and turn them on and then you have new skill sets, new capacities that you never had before. So I'm not really here to teach people about prayer. But I'm going to use the mechanism of prayer, the reference point of tefillah, to, 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 as a launch point for everything we're going to do in elevation, because the way you pray is the way you live, and the way you live is the way you pray. Refining this game over the last few years, I found if I ask a Torah Jew, what happens to their consciousness when they pray, that I can tell a lot of issues they have in their lives, in their relationships, their emotional blocks, and their spiritual issues. Because what prayer is, what tefillah is, is a perfect microcosm of all the skill sets you need to function at your full human capacity. And anyone that has a block in concentration, emotional issues, can't access the light, is struggling with a certain technique, can't build the relationship or feel the relationship. You show me a person that can't feel that relationship in real time, I will show you where they have relationship issues in their real life with other people. So what we're going to see is tefillah is a microcosm of everything that human consciousness can do and needs to do. And it's a training ground where if I immerse you into that, that we're going to start with a mastery program, immersing you into it, and you will see that when you turn on all these skill sets, all these powers, innate capabilities you have, you will be able to unleash in your intuition, your creativity, your perception, your spiritual capacity to build relationships, to, to overcome blocks. You'll see very, very fast that everything you need to master as a human being is really there in that perfect little ecosystem. So I'm going to pretend to teach you about tefillah, but I'm not really teaching you about tefillah. I'm really teaching you about consciousness. 
It's an entrance point. It's an entrance way, an access point for what I think we most need as human beings in this generation. What I'm going to do is build a map of human psychology. Now, I, I call, talk the word psychology a lot. I want you to know when I use the word psychology, I do not mean actual secular psychology. The word psychology, in case you don't know, is divided into two, two elements. The word psyche is actually a Greek word, which means soul, and ology means knowledge of. The word soul, nefesh, ruach, neshama, are always in Kabbalah and Hasidus, just words for consciousness, levels of consciousness. So our mechanism, our MO in elevation, is the way we're going to show you how to attain all these incredible skill sets is first map at the beginning of the Elevation Mastery, one, the first series, then what we're going to do is break down all your human consciousness into all the elements. Once you understand those elements, you'll be empowered to use yourself and consciousness and your mind in a way you didn't imagine possible. And, and, and all of, of self-development will now be in your hands because everything that happens within the full bandwidth of human experience, you'll understand what is happening to me, where it's sourced within me, and you'll have the power and the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to shift that and transform yourself through that. And to conclude this session, this is what I want to show you. As I began, I discussed nine elements, if you were counting, if you weren't. And I took off the Hebrew words, because each of them has its own dogma, each of them has its own fallen understanding, and we're going to re resurrect and rebuild each one, one at a time together. And if you notice over here on the board, I've written them out for you. The nine benefits of Torah's peak spiritual experiences. It's really supposed to be experience, but there you go. We'll fire the person that wrote the S and rehire, because she did a great job and she's a really talented girl in other areas as well. The nine benefits of Torah's peak spiritual experience. Torah's peak spiritual experience is tefillah. Tefillah is not prayer. We're going to deconstruct tefillah shortly. It is Torah's peak spiritual experience, which demands the ultimate peak human experience of all your full faculties. And what we're going to do in the Elevation Foundation series, each class its own, its own time, each, each, each idea will have its own class and its own session. We're going to go through these nine different elements. And these are new words that some of them, for some, for some of you, these are new words. For some of you, these are old words. But for everyone, there's going to be a, a sense of his chadshah, so a renewal, a deeper understanding of who you are, what you can do, what's possible. Now, I just want to practice saying something together. What I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you the Hebrew words. And I'm going to challenge you to actually use the Hebrew. There's a power in the Hebrew. There's secrets in the Hebrew. And besides the fact that our English is well contaminated and confused, you're going to see it gives us great strength to use the Hebrew terminology, especially if you like to get into, into the authentic sources yourself and unravel them. You'll see it's incredibly empowering once you get them down. So let's go through them together very fast. I'm going to say them. We're going to say them together just to get used to their sound and the shape of them in our mouths. Are you ready? The first one is Devakis. Say Devakis. Devakis. Loud and proud, you can do this. Devakis. Great. So you're going to get what that means shortly. Amuna. Amuna. You guys at home as well, you can do this. Amuna. Chius. Chius. Great. Chuva vitikonomitis. That's a little hard, isn't it? Let's break it down. If it's overwhelming, break it down. Chuva. Chuva. V. Not so hard. Tikun hamidus. Tikun hamidod. Looking after our Sephardi friends as well. We love all of the kind of people, as long as they speak exactly how I speak. Uh, Rafua Vabrius. Is that, hands up, that's hard. Hands up, that's hard to say. It's hard to say? Right, it's good. Then you just say it by yourself for five minutes. Go. Rafua Vabrius. Rafua? Rafua Vabrius. Now, rough translations, Devakis means divine connection. Amuna means, I don't even want to say what it means because you're going to get confused, right? Chias is energy. Chuva and Tikkunaminus is the source of all of self-transformation. Reform Brias means health and healing. Ruach HaKodesh. I'm going to teach you to have Ruach HaKodesh. If most rabbis with long beards here, the Daniel Katz is teaching you all how to have Ruach HaKodesh, they would go out of their mind and say, he's a heretic. I probably am, it's true. But it's not me that says I can teach you. The Baal Shem Tov says explicitly that you can learn it. And our sages already 2,000 years ago says every man 
man, woman, and child, every race, color, and creed has the capacity to do this if they just learn how. The fact that we don't, it, don't learn it, we don't embrace it, I don't know why. I do know why, but I'm certainly not going to talk it out loud in public at this point in the video. But this divine inspiration and supernatural knowledge is accessible to you. Say Ruach HaKodesh. Say it like you mean it, Ruach HaKodesh. Say it like you want it, Ruach HaKodesh. Great. His catalyst for his cash is, you'll never get to be able to say that, forget it, right? Took me six months to say it properly. But it's the capacity to inter-include your mind with other people and other beings in a way that you can affect them. To kabobaratson, that your mind can guide your destiny, guide the providence, shift the physical world yourself. And baltefila, well, that's our punchline, that's our destination. All these things, my friends, are what we're going to break down in the Elevation Foundation series. All of these are faculties that you have, incredible powers that you have, that our sages want you to know, want you to turn on and live with. And that's who we are, and that's what we're supposed to be doing in this world. This is not dogma. This is not a belief. You see this word, benefits? I don't like this word benefit, because it sounds like something you have to believe you will get a benefit from this. So we're going to shift one more thing before we begin. I like the word mechanisms. You don't have to be religious to understand the concept of mechanisms. These are the nine mechanisms behind the peak human experiences. Each of this is a mechanism that exists lying dormant in your consciousness, and we will teach you how it makes logical sense in a practical way to understand this, to tap into its true power, to understand where the capacity sits within you and how you can turn it on and unleash it. In Elevation Foundations, we're going to show you a map of the possible you, the nine mechanisms of Torah's peak spiritual experience, and when you get that down, when you get that vision, when you want that vision, that together we will enter into the experience of the mastery program, the seminars. You here? Wonderful. Glad to have you all with us. Can you please show this number seven? Number seven. His callous. His callous. The his cashless. It means to be bond, psychically bonded and inter-included with others. And I'll leave that others as broad as possible. <laughs> 